<laughs> G'day folks, I'm Mick from Sale from Ironman 4x4. Let's discuss the controversial subject of bull bars, underbody plates, side steps, battery equipment, canopies, roof racks, sliding systems, water storage, additional fuel, everything that can be done. Dun, 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 dun. G'day folks, I'm Mick Van Sale from Ironman 4x4. A rather busy day today, characterized by a couple of hours of discussion with some customers about shock absorbers. And what struck me was how important people uh, found shock absorbers to be on their suspension system. Uh, they weren't that worried about springs or the rest of it. Shocks were sort of the main topic of discussion. And the second thing that struck me, which you know, I've been aware of for a long time, is the amount of misinformation that there is on the internet regarding shocks. So I'm going to take a bit of time out now to try and demystify shock absorbers a bit, give you a bit of um, pertinent information about shocks, what to look for and what to be careful of when you're spending your hard-earned money on shocks. And then at the end of the video, I'll also be chatting a little bit about the Ironman range of shock absorbers. We get customers phone us uh, you know, all day long, every day looking for shocks, and when we tell them we have a couple of different types, that's where the confusion starts. So uh, let's get stuck into it. Um, I want to go back to the basics of shock absorbers first so that you can understand what the function of a shock absorber is and how it works and it'll you know, better enable you to make a good decision about what type of shock absorber uh, you want to get. So I'm going to be talking about normal shock absorbers that we use on our everyday four-wheel drives. The shocks that came on the vehicle and the shocks that you will upgrade them with. I'm not going to be referring to racing shocks or specialist shocks bypass shocks, remote reservoir shocks, they're very, those, you know, those types of shock absorbers are very few and far between. We're talking about these shock absorbers typically that you see here on the table in front of you. So with these shock absorbers, we refer to them as telescopic shock absorbers, and they're really the shock absorbers that are found on most, if not all vehicles, all model vehicles nowadays. We call them telescopic shock absorbers because the one part slides into the other part when they compress and when they move out, a bit like a telescope. And we also refer to these shock absorbers as being hydraulic shock absorbers because they are filled with oil and that is the medium that is used to generate the friction which makes the shock absorber work and I'll, I'll get to that later in the video and I'll explain that in a bit more detail. Let's talk quickly about the function of the shock absorber in the suspension system. In your vehicle suspension there are two main components, there are other components as well, but let's look at the two main components being springs and shock absorbers. Now. The spring in your suspension is the part of the suspension that keeps the vehicle at a certain ride height, carries the weight of the vehicle and the chassis, the passengers, the load, the constant load, the occasional load, carries all of those things at a certain ride height. The other thing that a spring does is it actually absorbs all the undulations and shocks in the road. That's all the function of the spring. And the way it does that is the spring absorbs energy from the combination of the vehicle and the, the vehicle hitting these undulations in the road. That energy is pushed into the spring. Now imagine this ruler was a spring and the energy will deflect that spring. If it's a leaf spring it'll deflect it, if it's a coil spring it'll compress it. But that spring is now deflected and that energy that was gotten from the undulations in the road is now sitting in the spring. Once the object in the road is gone, the spring wants to release that energy and it does that. And we refer to that as a spring oscillation, whether it's a coil spring or a leaf spring, that is an oscillation. And this is what happens in your vehicle when you go over a speed bump or a pothole in the road. Your spring gets a lot of energy and it starts exerting that energy and it oscillates and your vehicle goes bouncing down the road. You need to control that bounce, otherwise you will lose control of your vehicle and have an accident. And the way to control that oscillation is with a device that'll dampen the oscillation and that's where the shock absorber comes in. So strictly speaking, these aren't shock absorbers, they're absorbers of energy from the spring or actually spring dampeners. But for the purposes of this video we'll refer to them as shock absorbers because everybody does. But just bear in mind, they don't absorb shock, they control the spring, that's their function. How do they do it? So in the range of hydraulic telescopic shock absorbers, we also find two different types of shock absorbers. The one is a monotube shock absorber, and the other one is a twin tube shock absorber. Monotube shock absorbers, again, quite specialized. We do find them here and there, um, and I'll tell you what the main differences are a bit later on. But let's concentrate and focus on twin tube hydraulic 
telescopic shock absorbers. We refer to them as twin tube shock absorbers because they actually do have two tubes, an outer tube and an inner tube. The inner tube we also call the pressure tube because that's where all the work happens and the outer tube is called the reservoir tube. That is the reservoir that stores the hydraulic fluid or the oil inside the shock absorber. This is an approximation of a twin tube shock. You can clearly see the inner tube and the outer tube uh, because they're made of glass. And the inner tube is top filled with oil, so in other words oil throughout the whole length of that tube. And you'll see inside there is a piston, that's the working piston attached to the bottom of the piston rod. And as the shock absorber is working and moving, that piston moves up and down in the pressure tube through the oil. The outer chamber, which is the oil reservoir, you may notice that as I compress the shock absorber, the oil level in that outer chamber is rising when I compress the shock and it drops when I extend the shock again. The reason that's happening is because this hydraulic oil inside the shock absorber, you cannot compress it. It's a non-compressible fluid and when I push the piston down into the pressure tube, the volume of oil displaced by the shaft has to go somewhere. And what actually happens is it goes through a valve at the bottom, which we call the foot valve, and it then pushes up into the outer chamber or the reservoir chamber of the shock absorber. And so the oil moves in and out as the shock absorber is working. Let's very quickly look at some of the internal components of a shock absorber. The main component in the shock absorber is the actual working piston. That's this flat disc here, and that's the item that you saw there at the bottom of the piston rod. So this is a piston rod out of a shock absorber, out of an actual shock absorber. The piston is a flat disc and it is filled with, or it's not filled with, it has orifices or holes in it. And that allows the oil to flow through from the bottom to the top and vice versa, as I showed you just now, moving the piston up and down. It also has um, a valving system, which is really thin little shims. They look like very thin washers of spring steel, some mounted on top of the piston and some mounted underneath the piston. And those shims make up what we call the valve stack on the shock absorber. And they have different shapes and different sizes, and they restrict the flow of oil through the orifices of the piston. That's how they work. So with slow piston speeds, and that is typically when you're, for example, going around a corner and the vehicle is leaning over, it's compressing the suspension on the outside of the corner and it is extending the suspension on the inside of the corner. So the piston is moving very slowly through the oil. And what you wanna have then is you wanna have the most restriction of movement of oil through the piston so that you can help this vehicle not roll through corners. With high piston speeds inside the shock absorber, you actually want the oil to be able to flow through the piston um, more freely up to a point. You want to control it properly. So actually what happens is when you initially hit that pothole and the piston speed is high, the valving is pushed open and the oil flows through. But as the shock absorber is absorbing the energy out of the spring and turning it into frictional heat inside the shock, it'll start slowing the movement of the spring down and the piston valving will start closing and you'll have more resistance uh, towards the end of the travel of the shock absorber. We refer to this as digressive valving. So if ever you hear the term digressive valving, that's what it's about. Slow piston speeds, a lot of control, big piston speeds hitting potholes and the like. The control drops away relatively, but then it catches up again as the whole lot slows down. So let's imagine that this shock absorber is fitted to the back of your Hilux and you're traveling on a very smooth highway. There's very little piston movement, very little suspension movement, very little heat generated because there's very little energy going into the springs and everything is great. When you turn off the highway and you hit a gravel road with a lot of corrugations and a lot of what we call whoops, a lot of suspension movement, that's when things start heating up. And what actually happens is that the oil starts getting hotter and hotter as it's absorbing the energy out of the spring and at some point the oil will start overheating. Oil has a boiling point and what actually happens is you reach that boiling point and the oil starts aerating. So let me try and demonstrate this with this uh, example of the shock absorber. I'm gonna push down quite severely on this shock and I want you to take a look at the oil on top of the piston. You see momentarily it turned milky in color. I'll do that again. That's aeration. What's happening is that the speed of the piston through the oil is causing air bubbles to form in the oil. And as heat builds up, those air bubbles remain in the oil, aeration of the oil. And what it causes is a, a drop in the viscosity of the oil. The oil becomes more runny and it passes through the piston easier. And the shock absorber starts losing its effectiveness. And you feel that in your vehicle as shock fade. Your vehicle starts rolling around more, you start losing control of your vehicle, and that's the danger with overheating the shock absorbers. So to counter this heat buildup in the shock absorber, this problem that you have, the clever guys in the white coats and the thick rimmed glasses had a close look at the twin tube hydraulic shock absorber and said, you know, how can we make this thing absorb more heat? Now bear in mind that the oil inside this canister of the shock is only in contact with 
the bottom portion of the canister and that's the portion that it radiates the heat through. So the radiator for the shock is really the bottom half. On a typical hydraulic shock absorber it's the bottom two thirds of the canister that's radiating the heat. The top third where the gas is there's no radiation of heat or very little radiation of heat. So they had a look at this and they decided that one of the ways to do it was to put the oil under pressure. By putting the oil under pressure you raise the boiling point of the oil and you're actually preventing the aeration of the oil uh, at those temperatures where it normally would happen. So you're pushing that temperature up. So the oil in the shock absorber takes a lot longer to overheat and the shock takes a lot longer to fade. So that was their plan and it, it works very well. So what these clever engineers have come up with is they have decided to replace this air in the upper part of the reservoir with a inert gas under pressure and they decided on nitrogen gas. Inert gas doesn't absorb uh, heat. It's just there to put the oil under pressure. So that's one myth that I'd like to bust right now. The nitrogen gas doesn't keep the oil cooler. It doesn't absorb heat. All it does is put the oil under pressure. Now by putting the oil under pressure, you raise the boiling point of the oil and it takes a lot longer to aerate. You can travel down this road for much further and give your shock absorbers a bit more punishment than with a normal hydraulic shock absorber. But at some point, depending on how bad the road is and how desperately you want to get to the camel thorn and your gin and tonic, you might overcook even a nitro gas shock. So back to our clever engineers with the white coats and the thick rimmed glasses. They had a look at this whole setup and they said, well, what we actually need is more oil and a lot more oil. Referring back to our radiator, currently we're still only radiating at the bottom two thirds of the canister. And what they said was we have to radiate heat over the whole length of the canister. So the idea they came up with was to have the shock absorber top filled with oil, the inner and the outer chamber. They wanted to get the outer chamber full of hot oil so that the radiator for the shock absorber could be this entire canister. But the problem is they still needed some type of space somewhere in the outer chamber where the oil could go to that's being displaced by the piston rod that's going into the pressure tube. And the way they did that very cleverly was to insert a sock of closed cell foam material around the outer surface of the inner tube. And you can just see it over there. This material is very similar to wetsuit material, but it's not wetsuit material. It's purpose made for this application. It can withstand very high temperatures. It's closed cell, so the oil never mixes with the air inside this sock of material. And then what happens is as you collapse the shock absorber and that piston rod going into the pressure tube is displacing the oil into the reservoir chamber, it's actually just squishing that sock up. And this shock absorber is now referred to as a foam cell shock absorber as opposed to a nitro gas shock absorber. And those are really the two types of twin tube shock absorbers that are commonly found on four wheel drives both as standard and aftermarket. So that explains in broad terms how shock absorbers actually work. I want to just refer very briefly to the actual working parts inside the shock absorber that create the feel of the ride, create the control, create the comfort you're feeling. Um, and these are really the, the, the pistons in the shock absorber. So we have the piston that slides up and down through the pressure chamber, but we also have another valving system at the bottom of the pressure chamber that connects the pressure chamber to the reservoir. This is the foot valve. So when we actually compress the shock absorber, oil is flowing from below the piston to above the piston. But the oil that's flowing from the pressure chamber into the reservoir has to pass through a valving system at the bottom, the foot valve. Now, the downward stroke of a shock absorber we refer to as the bump stroke of the shock absorber and when a shock absorber is pulled out we call that the rebound stroke of the shock absorber and the bump stroke of the shock absorber is predominantly controlled by the valving in the piston but the rebound stroke is predominantly controlled by the foot valve. So you have two sets of valving that you have to tweak and fine tune to make the shock work properly and give you that control that you're looking for uh, in your suspension. Now, you'll notice here that I have a couple of different piston rods with pistons attached to them. And you'll see they, they vary in size. So it stands to reason that the better you graph your shock absorbers, the better they're going to perform and the better the result is that you're going to get. Now, let's just do some math for the moment because math is always good. Here I have some pistons out of different types of shock absorbers for the same vehicle and you'll see they vary quite significantly in size. This weenie one over here is the standard shock absorber on the rear of a Toyota Hilux. That's this little one over here. Just by fitting an uprated nitro gas shock absorber from Ironman 4x4 or most other of the other 
reputable brands, you'll see that there's a marked increase in the diameter of the piston and the shock absorber itself is actually also quite a bit bigger, more oil. And remember just now I said, oil is your friend, the more oil the better. Then we go up from this one to this one and I'll get into the sizes in a second. And this is the piston out of our foam cell shock absorber, again, bigger shock absorber, more oil, bigger piston. And then finally, the Brute out of the Ironman 4x4 Foam Cell Pro. I'll put that right back down again. Even bigger, a lot more oil, a lot more robust. So what is the significance of these different sizes? They're on the same vehicle and they're supposedly doing the same work. Well, it has to do with the surface area of the piston you're working with. The more surface area you have to work with, the better and the finer you can graph your shock absorber and make them ride really well. So the math, very quickly. This original Toyota shock absorber has a piston with a diameter of 30 millimeters. And that gives you a total surface area of just over 700 millimeters square of valving that you can play around with. The nitro gas shock absorber piston has a diameter of 35 millimeters which gives you a whopping 960 square millimeters of surface area. Now while the diameter is only 16.7 percent bigger the surface area is 36 percent bigger so you can see it's it's quite a lot bigger. The foam cell shock absorber has a 40 millimeter piston that's another 14 percent bigger but another 30 percent bigger on surface area and then the foam cell pro has a 45 millimeter diameter piston, which is 50% bigger than the standard Toyota shock, and it's 125% bigger in surface area. A lot more surface area to fine tune the damping uh, and valving of the shock absorber. So with all of this math, you might be asking yourself, which one is for me, nitro gas, foam cell, or foam cell pro? And let me try and clarify and simplify that for you by saying the following. The nitro gas shock is the best value for affordable performance in all common conditions. They're highly versatile. The shock is a big step up from the OME suspension in performance and control. And you saw that just by looking at the size of the piston. Next up, we have the foam cell shock absorber, which is really meant for people who do a bit more off-roading. The foam cell shock absorber will enhance your off-road durability and performance while still maintaining excellent on-road characteristics. In other words, you can use it for really any application. It excels in off-road conditions where heat buildup is a concern. The foam cell shock is larger in size, holds more oil, provides better dissipation of heat, and is longer lasting in all terrains. Last but not least is the foam cell pro shock, the premium shock, built to handle really anything. These shocks were originally designed to meet the demands of the armored vehicle industry, where reliability and durability are critical. Foam cell pro is the ultimate shock when the going gets tough thicker and stronger than just about any other shock on the market. It is well suited to trade vehicles, fleet vehicles, and of course, serious off-roaders. So in short, nitro gas shock works well in all applications. The foam cell is better, especially when you're doing off-roading. And if you're a serious off-roader or you just want the best shock absorber on the market, go for the foam cell pro. So apart from the three different types of shock absorbers that we offer at Ironman 4x4, we also offer different types of valving in all three of these ranges of shock absorbers. The three different types of valving are comfort valved, performance valved, and professional valve. And briefly, what that entails is, the comfort valve shock absorbers offer a soft ride for lightly accessorized vehicles. These are vehicles that don't carry much load and are best suited for lighter vehicles where your shocks are prioritized to give you a soft ride above all else. The performance valve shock absorbers are the ones we use most often and they adapt to a wide range of driving style. They're best suited to moderately loaded vehicles with some accessories and the shocks provide a balanced ride between comfort and more control. And then lastly we have the professionally valved shock absorbers. The professional valve shock absorbers are really limited to the foam cell pro shock absorbers. The professional range controls body roll and reduces pitching while driving over all terrains and they're best suited for heavily loaded vehicles with a higher center of gravity where the shocks focus on maximizing control and stability. So you can see that at Ironman 4x4 we have quite a wide range of shock absorbers covering a very wide range of applications. But at the end of the day folks it's all about control, it's all about safety and it's all about comfort. Nitro gas shock absorber, good all round shock absorber, works in all applications. If the going gets a bit rough, switch over to the foam cell shock absorber, can handle heat build up much better. And if you're really heavily loaded or the road is really bad, you should be looking at the foam cell pro shock absorber. This will handle anything you can throw at it. 
folks, I hope you found this video interesting and informative and that it's dispelled some myths that you might have had in your head and makes it a bit more clear why there are so many different types of shocks on the market. Certainly give us a call if you need some advice, it's free. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you're notified when we post the next one.